Joining us now, we're happy to welcome Patricia Churchland. She is a neurophilosopher, professor emerita at University of California, San Diego, and the author most recently of Brain Trust, What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. And I guess I should start by saying, welcome home to Canada. Yes, Do I say indeed. That? Yes, indeed. You're it's one of ours all... originally, right? Yes, I am. It's wonderful to be home. You're from Manitoba originally? No, I BC? grew up in British Columbia. I was one of the Okanagan Orchard brats. Okay, yeah. but most recently, I guess you left Canada 25, 26 years ago and you yes. were in Manitoba then. That's right. We, our first appointment was in Manitoba and that's actually where I learned my neuroscience. Excellent. Well, why don't we start there? What's a neurophilosopher? Good question. The idea that I had about 25 years ago when I was learning neuroscience in Manitoba was that it seemed quite clear that discoveries in neuroscience were going to help with old traditional philosophical problems. Problems about what's conscious, consciousness. What's the difference between being awake and being asleep? What is it to have a self and to represent yourself as having memories? What is it to think about things? And it seemed to me at the time that as neuroscience was progressing, that these wonderful old philosophical questions were going to be addressable at least to some significant extent by study of the brain itself. Is it true that for the majority of your earlier adult life, you tried to avoid these questions of morality? Well, with regard to morality in particular, I just thought the problem was too difficult because at first I really couldn't see how exactly what we see in human moral behavior and human social behavior could link up with evolutionary biology, except in a very abstract way, or how it could link up with anything that we knew in the brain. And if you can't sort of tether your hypotheses to real facts, or in particular to biological facts, I couldn't see how certain disagreements could be resolved within moral philosophy. And you weren't going to spend 40 years trying to figure it and out. And I didn't want to waste time. So somewhere you changed your mind. Uh, that's right. What got you to change and your mind? And that's very recently. And essentially something happened. There were particular kinds of discoveries that made me see the whole issue in a very different way. The discoveries really have to do with the way certain hormones interact with neurons in the brain in particular in mammals, and orient us beyond just caring for ourselves and our own well-being, but orient us to care for the well-being and the prosperity of others. So it would have taken certain breakthroughs in brain understanding for it you did. to change your position. It did. Huh. And there okay. was one very particular thing. I mean, you may want to ask me about this later. I don't know. But one very particular thing. And it was the discovery that long-term pair bonding in prairie voles, that is to say, after the first mating, the male and the female bond for life. They stay together, the male guards the nest, the male rears, helps rear the pups. They like to be together, they get depressed when they're separated from one another. And other voles are very different. And the question that was asked was, what's the difference in the brain? between those that show this behavior and those that don't. And what's the answer? And the answer is very particular, very specific. And the answer is that there are certain receptors. So a receptor sits on a hormone and waits for something. Mm -hmm. And there's a set of receptors that bind a very old peptide that's important in maternal and paternal behavior, binds to those neurons. When you have very dense array of those receptors for oxytocin and its sibling peptide, vasopressin, when you have a high density of those, you get long-term pair bonding. When you don't have a high density, you don't. That's at least in voles. Hmm. Now, I know you're going to ask me well, about so that's, humans. That's the prairie voles. That's the prairie voles. And, and they, they have do. this, And they have it. Montane voles do not. So they don't feel this obligation to be... And they don't feel be, that way. Right. They're not social in the same way. Isn't that quaint and romantic? It's wonderful. <laughs> and, and of course, it turns out, and I love this because I'm a Canadian, beavers also have long-term pair bonding. <laughs> Who knew? Fantastic. Uh, well, this is all right. This is fascinating because, of course, we presume that, you know, we presume that whatever unique morality we think we have as human beings is mm. because we've, you know, figured it out, right? We've yeah. gone through the 
cognitive process and decided this is the way it ought to be. Mm. But you're telling us science has a huger role in this than we've heretofore anticipated. Have I got that right? I think so. But let me put it in, and this is a bit s simplified, but I think it captures the heart of the story. There's a biological component and there's a cultural component. Okay. The biological component is really our urge for sociality. And we see it in chimpanzees, in beavers, in prairie voles, and all kinds of things. But the biological component in humans is also quite special. And that's partly because we are such extraordinary learners, and also because not only do we learn what's going on in the physical world and the social cultural world around us, but we can change those things. And so we are not only learners, but we're innovators. And we also, partly because we have such an extraordinarily large prefrontal structure in our brains, we have a capacity for planning in the long term, for deferring gratification, for suppressing certain kinds of antisocial impulses, and so forth. So it's, we share, I think, a platform in the biological sense with many other mammals. But, of course, we are also different mm -hmm. in having this capacity for problem solving. And that really is an essential part of the cultural aspect of morality. Can you say that, can you sum it up in, in, with the word humans? Because it seems that I mean, men and women are you know, so utterly differently wired that maybe, yeah. it, I don't know, maybe it's different? I think in the domain of sociality, there is a great overlap. Mm -hmm. But let me sort of step back and just say this, and that is, you know, within all biological species, there's a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. And so within humans, some are intensely social, some are like those prospectors we all saw as children who come down out of the hill once a, once a year and sort of grunt and get their, uh, get their butter and go back into the hills. And they're quite happy being that way. So there's a huge amount of, of variability. And there are some differences in sociality between males and females, but bonding and attachment is very fundamental. And it happens at the very earliest stages between mother and infant, also between father and infant. And of course, there's, there can be often very strong mate attachment between the parents themselves. Now, as you, as you say, it might take slightly different forms and shapes in males and females. Um, but I kind of see that as a, you know, a, a little bit of a difference that really is overwhelmed by a tremendous similarity in this need for sociality. Well, only because, I mean, is, is it fair to say that, that men don't have this need to be, you know, connected to one and only one person for their entire uh, adult lives where women I may have more? Know that Not it, sure about that? I don't Can't know if that, it eh? divides that way. Okay. I think there certainly is variability. And if you look across many different cultures, many cultures, of course, are polygamous, meaning one woman, uh, sorry, one man, many woman, women. But very often, even in those cultures, there is a woman with whom the, the, the guy will have a particular attachment. There's the main woman. Uh, the main woman. And then, of course, that all changes once there is property to be bequeathed. Mm -hmm. If you have a certain amount of property and many wives and many sons, then suddenly what was a very usable piece of property that would keep your family prosperous becomes a whole lot of very tiny pieces of property. And it was really with those changes that the social conventions promoting monogamy took hold and polygamy kind of shied away. But you know, there are also cultures in South America where one woman will have many men. And the thought is that it, and they don't know which of, let's say, four or five of them is the father. And the, the, the mythology that they have, probably rooted in their own lifestyle, is, is that it takes many men to rear a child. Hmm. Which system do you prefer? Well, you know, I mean, I was raised in, in this sort of a culture, and I've been happily married for 45 years. So I think if you looked at my density of receptors for oxytocin, they're probably <laughs> non-trivial. OK, gotcha. Yes. Well, I think we've spent most of the first part of this conversation talking about the neuro part of your neurophilosophical yeah. background. So why yeah. don't we try the second part of that word now and try the philosophical. Um, well, now, as soon as I say that, I think of one more question I want to ask you. So hang on, maybe hold off on that. What do you think the biological or evolutionary purposes of morality? 
Well, I think in the initial phase, we, we should t sort of talk about two phases. In the initial phase of evolution of mammals, they, you can, let's just anthropomorphize Mother Nature for now. But the problem was that the infants are born helpless. Rats, mice, shrews, and what have you. The payoff is the brain is very immature, but it has this six-layer cortex, which reptiles don't have. Well, this is very handy for learning about the physical world, for adapting to very different circumstances, for remembering details about the past, and so forth. The drawback is the infant is helpless. So the mammalian brain was essentially rewired so that the mother would kind of extend her domain of care, where she takes care of her own temperature and food and oxygen and the threats. Now she extends that to taking care of its temperature, food, oxygen, and threats. Is that mother only? No. And it's also, of course, in some species, dads. And father as well. Yeah. Okay. So, but it depends on the species and what the species evolved to be like. It's going to be a function of ecological conditions as well as its history and so forth. So how do we go from attachment and bonding yes. to morality. Yes, that yes. seems like a long yes. journey. That's the lovely question. Okay. And it was the voles that gave me the answer, and that is you can have a small genetic change which, which allows you to care not just for offspring, but also for mates, and another one to allow you to care for kin and affiliates, friends, and others, so that there be, can be a kind of ripple. Now, to see how this can happen, you have to know a little bit about oxytocin. So you might ask, what does oxytocin do in the brain? And we're beginning to understand a little bit of it. And part of the answer is, when oxytocin levels go up, stress hormones go down. Now, when stress hormones are high, we're not happy. We feel uncomfortable, we're alert, we're edgy, we're a little bit miserable. When stress hormones go down, we feel good. Oxytocin downregulates neurons in a region called the amygdala, which has a lot to do with fear responses. So your fear responses go down. Your autonomic responses go down for alertness and so forth. It's a kind of safety signal. And when animals have a lot of oxytocin and they feel that they can trust others around them, cooperative things tend to happen. Hmm as in the cooperation that we see in wolves as they hunt together to bring down a caribou, for example. Mm -hmm. And as in humans, when they feel comfortable, I can trust you, I know you're okay, or you know, you're not going to steal my goods and chattels, uh, then we can cooperate on a project. And so you don't so much need a gene for cooperation as you simply sort of need the background considerations for it. And then as particular social problems arise, like how to resolve conflict, uh, as well as how to cooperate on a difficult project, then social conventions and social practices come into being. But if much of this is rooted in biology then, mm. or have, is that the right word to use, I biology? I would say so, okay. absolutely. Then, then, me, then animals are moral. They have a morality to them, is I that right? I think that they do. Hmm. I, and I think that if you think about our human ancestors that lived roughly 300,000 years ago, small bands of 10 to 50 people maybe, yeah. roving around Africa, just really taking care of themselves and so forth. They took care of their children, they took care of each other, they probably in many ways at a fundamental level behaved not too differently. Hmm. Now, of course, they don't have certain kinds of social conventions that we do, like a criminal justice system, right. for example, um, or, or the wherewithal for trade, although that eventually did come as well. But I think the social conventions can grow up, and we see that actually even in marmosets, who also um, will, will share food, take care of one another's infants, and the males are very dedicated uh, to caring for the offspring. And, and we see it in chimpanzees, where there's a particular kind of way of doing business that will grow up and take root because it somehow works. Has it always been thus? With mammals. It has. And probably with birds. I, I, you know, I feel bad about leaving birds out of the story. And the only reason I'm leaving birds out of the story is 
the physiology of the bird brain is kind of different from the humans and not enough is known. But it looks like in birds we see much the same kind of behavior, especially if you think of the corvids, jays and um, blue jays and scrub jays and ravens and crows. Uh, there's a lot, there can be a lot of cooperation. There is long-term bonding between the mates. The male takes an active role in caring for the offspring. Hmm. Um, and so it may be a case of convergent evolution. It may be a case of a common ancestor. We're not really sure. Okay. In which case, I'm going to come full circle here okay. and, and come back to something we started at. Because, again, many people think that there is an inherent right and an inherent wrong yes. morality for yeah. human beings. Yeah. But you seem to take issue with that, suggesting that there is a, that morality, in some respects, is an evolutionary byproduct of, um, well, I want to say, I was going to say a mere evolutionary bright part, but it's not yeah, a mere no, evolutionary. It, yeah, no, but I it's see, more than that. It is more than can that. We, and can I you respond to that? I see that's where you're a, getting at. Yeah. And, and what I think the biology provides is this sort of basic disposition to extend care and to allow for cooperation. And then I think, especially in the human case, the capacity to reason, the capacity for us to problem solve together, to negotiate in a very practical way, has a lot to do with the development of those institutions that we think of as embodying morality, like mm. the criminal justice system. Um, but, but social problem solving is, is a very complicated kind of thing. Moreover, the, as the child, learns the social practices and convention. He's rewarded for doing, abiding by them, he's punished for not, and so his conscience in a certain sense gets built by his reward system, yeah. which is a very par powerful part of our brain. And so we feel guilty when we're at five and we're thinking, I could just take that piece of bubble gum and put it in my pocket and nobody would know. The guilt is there, but that's not because, in a certain sense, it's intrinsically wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, from Plato's heaven comes this truth. Rather, it's that your brain has been tuned up to respond in a very automatic way. This hypothesis of yours, can mm. I say it? It's yes, of yours? Yes, it is a hypothesis. Okay. Well, you know, I think there's many other people who have parts of the puzzle. Well, I was going to ask you about this. How controversial is this within the broader scientific world? It, it's a very interesting question. I mean, so far, the response to the book has been quite good. Um, I think that the neuroendocrinologists, such as Sue Carter, for example, with whom I have spent a lot of time working through some of the details about the role of hormones in the brain, um, think that this is a plausible line. But I'm glad you asked that, because it's important also to say that in a way, the hypothesis is still only in outline. There are many, many questions to which we do not have answers. Such as? Well, there are many more things that play a role in sociality than oxytocin and vasopressin, including our endogenous opiates. So that one of the things that happens when parents and children are very close, particularly, for example, when the mother is suckling the infant, is that there is a release of the endogenous opiates. It makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. Not, it doesn't make you feel high in any sort of demonstrable sense, but it's rewarding from the point of view of the brain. There are other chemicals that have to play an important part too. Um, you have to, if you're a prairie vole, for example, and you've mated for the first time, and now you scurry off and get something to eat, you have to remember who it was. Which of the guys was it? Mm -hmm. And if you block certain receptors in that female prairie vole's brain, she won't know, and so she can't bond. So there are many components to this story, and I feel that at the moment we're kind of at the beginning of it. But I do think it's a bit, that on the whole it's a more plausible story than saying that somehow magically morality comes out of pure reason, or that magically somehow it comes from an, an authoritative the, deity of The some Bible, kind. yes, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, You're not satisfied with those explanations alone? They don't, they don't really satisfy in the end. I mean, I think religions can actually play a fairly important role often in social bonding and in talking about moral issues and so forth. And, but one of the problems with thinking that it comes from a deity is that hundreds of millions of people, especially in Asia, 
have a religion that doesn't have a deity. Mm. And yet they have morality. And yet, of course. Yeah. And they also don't have anything that corresponds to the Ten Commandments. Mm. Um, and so they manage pretty much in the same way we manage, but we have this myth that you have to have a set of inviolable, exceptionless rules. You don't. I let, you're going to forgive this question. I bet you get it all the time. But I love to ask scientists this question. Do you believe in God? I don't, actually, except in, in what you might call a very, very weak sense in which you might say I'm a pantheist. I love nature. <laughs> I mean, I'm a good Canadian. Um, but I think as to the idea of a personal being who cares about my existence and to whom I can pray and who is particularly concerned that I be a Christian as opposed to a Buddhist or a Confucian, that doesn't seem to me all that convincing. How about a higher power that somehow is responsible for the fact that this world exists? Well, you can't be sure it's not the case, but there's not very much evidence for it. Um, so in that case, you know, you might just want to reserve, reserve judgment. But I think, of course, what worries many people is that religions are often used as an excuse to, to sort of whip up moral fervor to end up doing things that are really quite dreadful. And, you know, I think many people, including John Stuart Mill and Aristotle before him, worried about the mob. Um, and of course, we recently saw an instance of this in Afghanistan and the mobbing of the UN, um, the UN yes. Center. And, and I'm sure in the light of day, those people would reflect on this behavior and think, how could I have done such a thing? Well, because somebody wanted to burn a, a Koran somewhere else. Yes, which itself was a rather unnecessary thing to do. You think? Mm -hmm. um, let me try this. I'm not sure you can mention Sam Harris in the same breath as oh, John Stuart yeah. Mill or, or Aristotle, yeah. but he's a guy who's written a couple of pretty important yeah. books and had a lot of Absolutely. discussion. The End of Faith, The Moral Landscape, two very influential books. What do you think of his argument that science, and basically science alone, ought to determine what's moral and what isn't? I think he's quite wrong. I think he's absolutely wrong. And it's very interesting. I know Sam very well, and, and he and I have talked about this. And I said, look, Sam, there's not one single example in that book of a neurobiological fact that has an impact on a particular moral issue. It has no impact whatever on an issue like should we have an inheritance taxes and to what degree. It has no impact on the question of should those of us who have two healthy kidneys be obliged to give one up or on a related question which is should all people who die have their organs harvested. Those fundamentally are issues where the facts are always relevant. That that's not just what Sam wants to say. He wants to say, moreover, we can determine what should be the case just by asking scientists. Scientists are in no better position to answer that question, certainly not neuroscientists, than ordinary farmers and fishermen, uh, TV producers and policemen and so forth. And that's why I think it's so important that we come together in a diverse way to negotiate answers and where we don't think we're coming from absolute moral certainty where I've got it all right and you alas and alack have not. Hmm. Um, but, and, and, and so I think he's just wrong about that and I think it also is a misleading idea to sort of give to the general public that somehow scientists are more morally wise. We're not. The most morally wise people I ever knew were those farmers in the Okanagan. How come? Well, I think they had had a wealth of experience. I think they lived close to the pinch of reality. And bear in mind that most moral philosophers live a long way from the pinch of reality. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that they talked about these things a great deal. I think they read a great deal. I remember going into one farmer's house to babysit children and finding the whole of the Harvard classics. Hmm. My father, who was not well educated at all, um, had read Darwin. 
And I would hear them at night arguing about these issues, arguing about religion and about evolution and about the way certain things should be done. Should the river in the Okanagan be straightened? And if it were, what would happen to the wildlife and so forth? And they took it very seriously, and they took argument very seriously. Now, I'm sure there's many other wonderful people who, who are morally wise, too. But moral wisdom does not come uniquely to people who have had a life in science. Understood. Patricia, I want to thank you so much for visiting us here at TVO. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's been We're wonderful Grateful for, me. for your time. Thank you so much. It's been great. Patricia Churchland, Brain Trust, What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. A heck of a lot, apparently. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot.